And got it? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of uh, One Plus One, uh, your place for inconvenient truth telling and myth busting. And uh, we are joined by uh, uh, by we uh, and this is uh, this is another one of our All Things Canada edition, which is very appropriate because it's Flag Day in Canada, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we're going to be pushing back against uh, uh, Canadian nationalism and militarism today. And we are joined by uh, Tamara uh, Lawrence, uh, uh, no, Tamara Lawrence, who is a uh, academic and a uh, peace activist anti-imperialist activists and yeah let's uh, let's get right in uh, to it so uh tamara thank you uh, so uh, thank you so much for joining me today thank you very much yuri for having me it's uh it's a real honor to have you because uh i actually attended two uh zoom uh online zoom events one which was hosted by the canadian foreign policy institute and another which I think was co-hosted by uh, your your uh, your your woman-led uh, peace organization, and I was very impressed with your presentation and how you were, you know, pushing back against all the NATO uh, propaganda. And and uh, one one of the events you had you had the wonderful uh, uh, black uh, Canadian uh, poets and peace activists uh, L. Jones uh, uh, talking, uh, you know, talking about why Canada should not be supporting fighter jets and you had uh uh the uh, the the ndp or uh randall garrison who apparently he's an environmentalist but apparently he thinks militarism is the answer so it was great to have you push back against that and have l with her wonderful poetry also push back against that so it's a real honor to uh to have you on <laughs> Great. It's wonderful to talk about Canadian foreign policy and international affairs. Very important conversations to be having. Definitely. And uh, yes, yeah, so uh, so so the first question I, I uh, want to ask you, uh, uh, Tamara, is uh, uh, what is uh, what is the organization that you're affiliated with? And talk to me about your organizations and your uh, and, and your uh, responsibilities in uh, in uh, yeah, in your organization. So, I'm a longtime peace activist, environmentalist, and feminist. I'm very active in the peace movement because I came to realize about 15 years ago that we are never going to progress on environmental issues. We are never going to achieve climate justice and environmental protection if we don't get serious about peace because the military militarism uh, uh, is a, a huge problem and they're you know the biggest environmental polluters, uh, most contaminated sites, um, largest consumer of fossil fuel, etc. So about um, 15 years ago, I started to become even more uh, active in, in the peace movement. I'm a member of the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace, and mm -hmm. I'm a member of the Canadian chapter of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. I'm also on the International Advisory Committee of World Beyond War and the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space. and. There's a couple of other organizations that I'm involved in, too, because it's so important to have these transnational connections with other organizations and with other peace activists and movements. So I'm also a, a member of the Canadian Pugwash Group and the No to NATO Network. I'm in, yeah, make sure make sure to send me all those links so I can link it, uh, you know, after the interview is done and putting it on YouTube then. <laughs> Because it's cause, because it's great to know that there is, uh, uh, you know, there's, you know, you know, because there's a, there's a perception. Uh, I mean, at least the perception I sort of uh, get when I follow Canadian topics is that the anti-war movement is very weak and is very small because too many people think, uh, too many Canadians uh, think that Canada is a force for good in the world and that military and 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 that 
and, and, and that Canada doesn't do warmongering, Canada does peacekeeping, and that evil only started under Stephen Harper and later Justin uh, Trudeau. And the fact that you just listed all of these sort of organizations means they're like, no, 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 there actually is a growing body of Canadians who have always been, you know, speaking out against uh, Canadian uh, Im uh, imperialism and, 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 and trying to debunk the mythology uh, which, you, you know, which past guests on the show Eve Angler and Dimitri Lascaris and so forth work hard to, uh, yeah, fight against, right? Well, Yuri, I absolutely agree with you that there is a misperception in Canada that we are a, a peacekeeping country, that we have an independent foreign policy for from the United States. There's... Um, a, a misperception that Canada is uh, a good or a benign force in the world. And uh, that's not the case, as you know. Uh, for those of us who follow very closely Canadian foreign policy, we know it's the exact opposite. Canada has um, its own independent imperial uh, interests. It is also part of a bully club with the United States and with with NATO, and we can get into that more. Um, but I, I do just want to say at the outset that it is really important for Canadians to to dis, to dispel that that myth that we are a peacekeeping uh, country. Canada hasn't been doing peacekeeping seriously in over twenty years. If you look at the UN Peacekeeping Office, they do rankings. They do statistics every month to show how uh, to. to to, to look at how countries are contributing to UN peacekeeping. Canada right now is ranked 75th among all countries in the world contributing to peacekeeping. We have a mere 39 peacekeepers, 39 soldiers that are wearing uh, blue, hel blue helmets. Uh, yeah. 25 years ago, Canada did send thousands of soldiers on UN peacekeeping operations, but not so anymore. What Canada is sending hundreds and hundreds of troops to is to NATO operations. So right now we have about 450 soldiers in Latvia on a very aggressive NATO operation. Um, and, you know, we only have 39 peacekeepers that are doing a uh, UN work. So Canada is not a peacekeeping country. Canada is very much part of a of, of, of an aggressive military alliance with our closest defense partner, the United States, and with the alliance, NATO. Yes, and also part of the uh, Five Eyes Alliance, which is uh, which is which four of them: uh, Canada, the U.S., Australia, New Zealand, all settler colonial countries, and all we know, which were part of you know the British uh, Empire. Now I would call it the Anglo-American. Uh, Empire, and that when Canada and 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 even when Canada does uh, send peacekeeping force, it's actually a front for militarism, as you know, at you know, as Canada support for the coup in Haiti and the still ongoing uh, destruction of uh, you know of the Haitian anti-colonial movement. No, I mean when Canada you, you know uh, is doing peacekeeping, no, it's doing warmongering. It's uh, but and and is and but is hiding behind you know those blue uh, helmets and even in the, uh, I, I mean, we, we, we won't talk about it too much, but, uh, but I know, uh, you know, it's Black History Month and Canada was part, uh, and Canada's UN peacekeeping force was actually a partner in crime to Paul, Kugabi, uh, uh, Paul Kagame's epic crimes against humanity towards his own people, as well as uh, what's, uh, and, and, and still the ongoing humanitarian catastrophe in Congo, right? Oh, uh, absolutely. Uh, six months. If you if you want to just talk briefly about uh, the Congo, I mean, six months before Patrice Lumumba was assassinated, I, I believe he came you, he came to Ottawa. I mean, can, Canada supported the Belgian and American uh, coup in in the Congo that pushed out, you know, I mean, the first independent democratically elected leader in the Congo who wanted to help, uh, you know, nationalize uh, resources to, to benefit the people. I mean, Belgium, uh, the uh, Congo, as you know, was under a brutal uh, Belgium uh, occupation 
occupation and yep. millions of people were 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 killed and and subjugated it was absolutely horrible canada uh, that's that's emblematic of canadian foreign policy for the last 60 years canada has partnered with that anglo american um, empire of the United States and Australia and the United Kingdom to undermine democracies all over the world, to uh, to um, ensure that Canadian corporations have access to the resources of other countries. Canadian mining companies are operating on the African continent in Central and South America, uh, displacing communities, uh, con contaminating um the environment uh, treating workers you know terribly um so uh, uh, can yeah. canadian yeah can canadian foreign policy on the african continent has has been absolutely terrible and that's a perfect segue uh to uh that's actually a perfect segue to uh act yeah, actually, that's a perfect segue to this uh, second question before we get into uh, your campaign against uh, NATO. And I actually wanted to ask you because, you know, uh, be because, you know, you mentioned you're a, uh, you know, you're, you know, you're a feminist and one of the organizations you work with, which is a Canadian led peace, uh, you know, peace group, anti-imperialist group. And I want to just ask you, you know, what to you is feminism and how is the feminine and, and how is the feminist the feminism you believe in integral to uh to not to not canadian peacekeeping but but peacemaking and why do you think both both the movements of feminism and the anti-war anti-imperialist movement uh should be linked when you know when one when one talks about being a feminist the organization that i'm principally with the canadian voice of women for peace uh, has at, uh, at its core a feminist peace perspective. And what that means is we have a more radical, anti-militarist perception on, on, on feminism. So feminism can be understood as a spectrum. You know, there's a diversity of, of views among uh, the women's movement, uh, about what feminism means. So if you talk to different women, they'll have different understandings about feminism. Many of us see it on a spectrum. So on the one side, you have a more liberal conception of feminism, where it's an understanding that uh, we just need to make institution, institutions um, more welcoming of women. We need women's equality. Women just need to be um, at all levels of of institutions and positions of power and deci decision making. So that's on the one end, a more liberal conception of feminism where you just want to see, uh, you just want to have more women or you want to have gender equality or women's equality, that kind of thing. On, on the, the other side of the spectrum is a more uh, radical anti-militarist uh, perspective on feminism where it's not just trying to get women in positions of power or decision making or have more um have more women participating it's 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 going to to the root of women's oppression and subjugation and it's really looking at those institutions and those systems that are you know dominated by uh, by men that are patriarchal that are misogynistic and and uh, working to dismantle them working to abolish them and to uh, work with other women and partners to rebuild something that's good for everyone so for the canadian voice of women for peace um we don't we don't ascribe to the position that oh uh, the military needs to have more women right now the canadian military has a target to try to get 25 percent of its of its um, Canadian armed forces to be to be women. So they've got this target by over over the next five years to try to reach 25%. Right now, um, there's about 16% of the Canadian armed forces are women. 
our perspective with the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace is we want to demilitarize. We want to abolish the military. I mean, let's talk about what the military really is. The military is um, a a male dominated um, colonial project that is that uh, supports um, violence, right? The training of of soldiers to use weapons and to injure and kill people and to destroy things. It glorifies war. It um, the principles of Glor hierarchy Glor and domination. Glorifies violent masculinity as well. Absolutely. It it it's a uh, it totally. Um, it, it's it is premised on a, a violent hegemonic form of ma masculinity and so as an, an institution we don't think that the military should even even exist we are offended by even the idea of of uh, of a military of men with with guns you know providing security we don't believe that at all um what provides security for women are things like affordable housing uh, access to uh you know free universal health care uh quality a free universal child care and quality education and, um, yeah. you know, parks and recreation. I mean, those are the kinds of things that, that, that provide security. So we do not support the military. We don't support militarism. And so a, a radical feminist perspective on the military is, is, is looking at the root of it, seeing that it's an illegitimate patriarchal institution that should be abolished. I completely agree with that. But uh, one quick follow-up. What do you say to... Uh, Women, I'm pretty sure the Hillary Clintons of the world uh, uh, and the Christia Freelands of the world would say that w say that we need to reform this predominantly male in uh, male patriarchal institution by actually having more women in that. What, what what do you say to that? That 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 that, that, that if there was more women in the police, more women in you know in the you know in the military, then everything would be. That you know, then wars would be so much, you know, they would be fought so much more softly as opposed to, you know, the systemic war crimes we always that's always associated with war, in which women are often, you know, the first major victims of it. So what? So what would you say to those, to those uh, cynical fem uh, feminist reformers uh, when they say that we just need more women in the military and more women generals? Well. Women don't want to join the military. Canada, Canada opened, uh, Canada opened all positions up to women. So, including combat positions to women, about thirty years ago. So, there was a Supreme Court of Canada decision that said that there should be equal access for women to, in the military. So, Canada was one of the first Western countries that actually allowed women to serve in combat roles. It, the United States and the United Kingdom have only opened up combat positions to women in the last couple of years. So, despite the fact that the military is, it, 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 all aspects of the military are supposed to be open to women, uh, women are not joining. It's only made up of 16% of women. The the institutions that where women dominate it are institutions like you know healthcare, education, in the caring economy. What women want to do is things that really benefit, really benefit society, benefit their families, you know, benefit the environment. I mean, that's where women are. So if the people like Hillary Clinton, who was an absolutely was an absolute hawk, she supported the war in. Iraq, she's the one that, you know, led the war in in Libya, for instance, um, Syria. And, she supported, yeah. and Syria, absolutely, the coup in Honduras. I mean, her record is absolutely horrendous. And it was one of the reasons why she she she, uh, you know, failed to become uh, president. She supported all of the increases to military spending in the United States. Um, well, she. she she does not have uh, support of women. This is why you know she didn't win, and 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 women uh, re reject that uh, 
th that position, you know, women aren't joining. Women aren't listening to Hillary Clinton and to Christia Freeland um, to to join the military to to support the wars and interventions and coups. Women aren't buying it. We're smarter than that. <laughs> Thank God, uh, thank God for that. And actually, it's uh, and actually an interesting uh, note because you have some of these feminists who say that you know we need to, uh, uh, you know, uh, I call them cruise missile feminists, drone loving feminists. Who and 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 the funny thing is, is that uh, you know Libya and Syria. Okay, yeah, you can you can you 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 can make the arguments that uh, that uh, you know that Assad and Gaddafi uh, and even Saddam Hussein. Uh, their uh, human rights record in general, yeah, is is pretty much you know uh, you know kind of a D or 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 even an F, but they were secular societies, and the women and the women of those societies had way more rights than what you see now in Iraq, which is a complete basket case of warring, uh, uh, you know, ultra Sunni fundamentalism. Syria is trying to resist what happens uh, in Libya and Iraq. Afghanistan, even in which uh, Miss Clinton's uh, husband, Bill Clinton, you know, propped up the uh, Taliban there. So, yeah, no, uh, no, uh, no, no, no advancement for feminism comes from those comes from those imperial wars. Uh, Yuri, and I will just add that there's there's a, a dangerous play going on in Canada. Uh, Christia Freeland, when she was foreign affairs minister three years ago, announced that Canada had a feminist foreign policy. Uh, we we don't actually have a written of uh, foreign policy, and she never she never consulted and never described what this so-called feminist foreign policy is. She just said that, oh, you know, Canada cares about feminist foreign policy, you know, looking at what Sweden is doing. And then last year, the uh, Global Affairs Department, Canada's Foreign Affairs Department announced consultations on a new feminist foreign policy. It's going to be our first feminist policy. They're going to put something down in writing. But <laughs> Um, and this is supposed to come out this spring. There were some consultations, but they were very limited. Um, and I think it will be very important for uh, the international community to carefully scrutinize what Canada says it's doing around foreign feminist foreign policy and what it's actually doing. So, you know, Canada has illegal sanctions against um, many countries, Nicaragua, Venezuela, Russia. Uh, Canada um, has, uh, you know, soldiers in, uh, in, um, in Jordan, they were in Iraq and in Latvia, and um, we have fighter jets in Romania. Um, Canada is refusing to join the new treaty to ban nuclear weapons. Um, none of this is feminist. None of this is good for women. And we are planning on, you know, buying fighter jets, building warships, um, increasing military spending to abide by the NATO target. None of this is feminist. None of this is good for women and girls. So the international community really needs to critique and challenge when the Canadian government says that it's got a feminist foreign policy and that it cares about about feminism. Uh, you have to look at its deeds and and um, and really challenge that. Yeah, and what kind of a and what kind of a feminist supports the uh, the Gulf monarchs, which are exporting uh, you know patriarch uh, re, uh, you know the most vile patriarchal. Uh, Groups like you know ISIS and so forth, and what the and what the Saudis and the UAE are doing in uh, Yemen. Well, yes, exactly, Yuri. I mean, under this Trudeau-led liberal government, you know, Christia Freeland was Minister of Foreign Affairs. She signed off on more arms exports to Saudi Arabia, despite knowing that this is the worst humanitarian crisis in the world. The uh, US-led Saudi war on Yemen has been absolutely terrible for the people. I mean, the people are starving. They don't have uh, health facilities. And Canada, uh, Trudeau and Freeland signed off on more light armored vehicles to Saudi Arabia, more guns to Saudi Arabia. Our, 
arms exports have increased under this uh, liberal government. So there is this veneer of um, this veneer that's used, you know, Canada cares about a feminist foreign policy. Canada cares about human rights. We have a very attractive prime minister, you know, Justin Trudeau. We, you know, Christia Freeland yeah. as our foreign affairs minister. Now it's Mark Garneau. You know, Canada projects to have, you know, to care about human rights and these kinds of things abroad. But uh, if you if you lift up the veil, if you look behind the veneer to see what Canada is really doing, it's 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 violent it's illegal it's undermining human rights it's causing a lot of harm to people around the world and it needs to stop and that's a perfect segue to uh, to this third question of mine which is uh, which is talk to me about uh, why your organization is campaigning on uh, no to NATO uh, yeah why is your organization opposed to uh, NATO and I ask not only because of my own opposition to NATO, but because so many, uh, you know, I, I was talking to you off the air about how so many left-leaning uh, folk in, uh, you know, in uh, Europe, as well as Canada, and others who claim to believe in peacekeeping and and the noble human and noble humanitarian interventions, including the the woman that we've that, that we've been speaking out on, Miss Chrystia Friedland of the Liberal Party, the former foreign secretary, but she still is a major figure in the current regime of Justin Trudeau. I mean you have people who lionize her, Angela Merkel, Hillary Clinton, who we already spoke out against, but even uh, you know, Jacinda uh, you know, Arden of you know of New Zealand. And you have so many social democrats across Europe, even Greens, who believe NATO is a much needed peacekeeping force against, uh, yeah, you know, against uh, you know the big bad Russians and so forth. And and they and, and they and they honestly do think that supporting NATO advances feminist policies. So, your reflections on that? So the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace has been opposed to NATO for a long, long time. And we decided uh, three years ago that we needed to uh, raise greater awareness about our opposition to NATO and to build a national movement in Canada to oppose the alliance. So we have a campaign, Feminists Against Militarism, Women Say No to NATO. When NATO had its uh, 70th anniversary in 2019, we held a monthly protest outside the NATO Association of Canada office, which is in Toronto. Every NATO member has a NATO association that helps uh, amplify NATO, NATO's messages in their respective countries. So it's, a, it's basically a propaganda wing of NATO. So we held a monthly protest outside the NATO Association of Canada office. We had these fantastic signs, Canada out of NATO, no to NATO. And we passed out leaflets and we collected uh, signatures. And we have launched a campaign to try to turn the, the public and politicians away from NATO because we see so clearly that NATO is a dangerous military alliance that is uh, one of the greatest obstacles to international solidarity and to the things that we really care about. For instance, the um, uh, climate action and, uh, and human rights and peace around the world. So uh, I'd just like to give a little bit of, of basics about NATO. So NATO started by 12 yeah. countries in 1949. And if you think about these 12 countries, Canada, Belgium, um, uh, France, uh, the United Kingdom, Netherlands, uh, the United States, I mean, these, these, are, these were colonial countries. If you look at the documents and the photographs from the very first meeting, I mean, you can see it's all, it's, 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 it's all white men. Uh, that founded this military alliance, um, and it what the Warsaw Pact, the Soviet Union alliance, didn't start for six years later until 1955. Now the Warsaw Pact, uh, the Soviet Union and its satellite countries, it fell 
once the Berlin Wall fell and the Soviet Union, you know, ceased to exist and the Warsaw Pact dissolved in 1992. NATO, a military alliance, should have been dismantled at the same time, but it, 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 it has, it's maintained. And if you really look critically at NATO's uh, post-Cold War record, its illegal bombing of Serbia in 1999, its a bombing and destruction of Libya, its failed combat mission in Afghanistan, um, and, you know, its interventions in Eastern Europe and its, you know, aggression towards uh, to Russia, the the coup that it helped to instigate in the Ukraine in 2014, it just goes on and on. If you really look uh, carefully and critically at its post-Cold War wet record, you cannot support this military alliance anymore. You just, you just can't. The other thing that's so important to consider is that NATO is an alliance. It's, it's a military alliance of 30 countries, of only 30 countries. Most of the world is not in NATO. Right? There's 192 countries that are part of the United Nations. 100 and 62 of those countries are are outside are outside of NATO. What NATO really is is it's a military alliance to preserve western domination. Um and particularly uh, a, an alliance that is controlled and dictated by the United States to circumvent the uh, the United Nations and to undermine the uh, UN Security Council. So uh, uh, NATO is just is just a male dominated military alliance of, of Western countries. It's a new neo-colonial project. It's engaged in very dangerous destabilizing operations and it absolutely must be resisted. And we need to uh, unite our voices in all NATO member countries to work for its dissolution. I also want to add that one of the reasons why the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace is so opposed to NATO as well mm -hmm. is because in 2014, the NATO members at the summit in Wales made an agreement that they would increase military spending to, by 2% of GDP by 2024. Right now, Canada's military spending is about uh, almost 29 billion dollars a year 29 it is by far that department the military gets more than any other department in in the canadian government it gets a tremendous amount of money but at that amount about 29 billion dollars it's only 1.3 percent of gdp if canada meets the nato target we are basically going to go bankrupt um we cannot afford the nato target and it, it is just it's it's absolutely it's absolutely irresponsible it's absolutely unjust so uh we do not want uh canada to meet this two percent target of military spending we don't want um canada to buy new weapon systems and the pressure to increase military spending and to buy new weapons systems comes primarily from nato and from the united states uh, one quick follow. Uh, one quick follow up to that. You mentioned. Uh, uh, you mentioned uh, Serbia. Now, I'm. I'm definitely of the opinion that. Uh, uh, you know, whatever you know, Slobodan Milosevic was doing, it was illegal. Uh, what uh, NATO did in Serbia, because uh, be, because because it wasn't. It was a civil war. It was an internal civil war. Uh, I. I, I know a person from uh, uh, from uh, Kosovo who who believes in 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 in, in Kosovo nationhood, and she supported uh, NATO's uh, bombing of uh, of uh, Serbia. And uh, so, so what would you say to somebody like her who who who, who describes herself as being uh, of the left, uh, but but will have the opinion that. NATO was a bit of a necessary evil because Milosevic was this brutal monster oppress, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, oppressing the people of Kosovo. How 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 would you uh, push back against that and try to you know convince uh, this person that 
that uh, no, NATO is not the answer, and 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 more broadly, war you know you know war was not the answer to uh, to uh, you know uh, what happened in uh, Yugoslavia, the, the 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 dissolution of Yugoslavia. Well, actually, there are some very brave uh, uh, Kosovar politicians who've spoken out against uh, NATO. There was a woman I've forgotten her name just a few months ago. Uh, spoke out against NATO, and um, uh, so there, there's there's me many many people in the region that have seen that NATO has um, you know has has uh, has militarized the region. One of the largest U.S. bases in the world is in is is uh, Camp Bonspiel in in Kosovo, and um, if you think historically about the former Yugoslavia, um, the the former Yugoslavia was uh, was one of the co countries that was really leading the non-aligned movement. It wasn't part of the the Soviet sphere, but it also was was um, was a was a country that had more of a, an independent socialist perspective, and when. In the mid 19 well, it, it, there there have been some excellent um, writings about uh, uh, the situation in the former Yugoslavia. A woman by the name of Diane Johnstone wrote, you know, ex wrote an excellent book about how um, NATO was a, a terrible force in the region, uh, particularly the United States and Germany as well, helping to break up the former Yugoslavia. Um, um, you know, to to get their military and to get their corporations in there to, you know, to end that socialist project. But uh, what NATO did in 1999, bombing Serbia and Montenegro, uh, it was illegal. It, it violated international law. And Canada's former ambassador uh, to uh, the former Yugoslavia, Albania, and Bulgaria. His name is James Bissett. I mean, he he yeah, you know yeah, he I'm said at the, he said yeah. at the time he said at the time, and he said consistently that that it was that it was illegal, and it actually opened the door to um, more illegal NATO interventions. It actually paved the way for what the United States, for instance, did in. In Iraq in 2003, and what NATO did in Afghanistan in 2001 and 2002. So uh, it, it was actually very. Stuff. Yeah, I, there was. It was packaged as a humanitarian in, intervention in 1999, though there was no UN Security Council resolution to uh, to support the action, and then. Um, our, our countries, Canada, the United States, the UK, have used things like humanitarian intervention and and um, responsibility to protect to intervene militarily. Um, uh, so there is actually still resistance in, for instance, in in Serbia against NATO, uh, really in throughout the region. Um, uh, against NATO, because now, like for instance, a country like Montenegro, um, and uh, you know, and, and like North Macedonia that have just joined NATO, they have responsibilities now to increase their military spending to two percent of GDP. But this deprives their people um, of the resources that they need to invest in important social and environmental programs. So it's not NATO has not been good for the region. NATO has not been good for Kosovo. Uh, it's it, it it hasn't been good for the region. NATO hasn't been good anywhere. Uh, one of these days, I'll have to organize a uh, debate between uh, you and that uh, friend of mine to uh, <laughs> to yeah push back against that. And I, you know, I you know, I, and uh, so so is it safe to say that what happened in uh, uh, Kosovo and the breaking up of Yugoslavia, which which you said was you know what was western imperialism dividing and conquering the balkans to to break up the country which now they're all you know mostly you know these far right uh uh you know you know you know republics is it safe to say that that model that 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 nato did that nato inflicted 
on the former Yugoslavia was uh, what was the models that we later saw for more criminal imperial wars like Libya, Syria, and uh, yeah, and elsewhere. Yes, I, I think so. And I think it's more than that, actually. Uh, in the mid-1990s, uh, Lockheed Martin led a U.S. NATO expansion project throughout Eastern Europe. So the American weapons manufacturers saw uh, NATO as and the expansion of NATO as as an arms as good for their arms, as increasing markets for their weapon systems. And so the, uh, it, it, the US weapons manufacturers in the mid 1990s pushed really hard to get the countries in the Eastern Europe, for instance, and some in the Balkans to join NATO. Because as part to become a member of NATO, to be a member of NATO, you need to be interoperable with the with the United States, which is obviously the largest military in the world. You know, they're spending $750 billion on, on their, their military. And, you know, the Ru Russia is, is ranked like fifth in the world with $65 billion that they spend on their military. I mean, there, there, there is no comparison, but NATO constantly is making uh, Russia as, as the enemy as the bad guy uh, it, it's it's totally ridiculous but in order for countries to be a member in the alliance uh, they need to stay interoperable they need to constantly upgrade their weapon systems or get new weapon systems so that they can they can soldier alongside the united states and and they they end up having to buy u.s weapon systems and so it's NATO is really good for American weapons companies like Lockheed Martin, General Dynamics, Boeing, L3, all of these companies. As as General Smedley, as the late General Smedley Butler said, wars, you know, wars are rackets. And that's a perfect segue then to uh, to uh, this question, which is now your organization is one of many peace groups, anti-war, anti-imperialist groups that is trying to stop Canada's purchase of fighter jets. And uh, you already explained how, how, how militarism is, uh, uh, you know, inflames the ongoing uh, climate uh, crisis. So explain why this is a vital campaign for your organization to be involved in. And can you discuss not just the human cost that, 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 that this weapon of mass destruction causes, but in terms of the ongoing climate crisis, why, if one wants to continue living on Earth <laughs> and pushing back against the climate crisis, they need to be involved in, in, in stopping the purchase of these fighter jets. Uh, yeah. So in 2017, the Trudeau Liberal government announced its new defense policy. And its defense policy is primarily informed by our defense relationship with the United States and our membership in NATO. That's what's driving our defense policy. And in that policy, it said we were going to buy new fighter jets. And then in 2019, the Canadian government opened up its competition for new fighter jets. And last uh, summer, in June of 2020, the competition for new fighter jets closed and three companies submitted bids to supply the Canadian military with new uh, combat aircraft. So Sweden's Saab is offering its Gripen fighter jet, Lockheed Martin with its F-35 and Boeing with its uh, Super Hornet. The Canadian government says that it wants to buy 88 new fighter jets for a cost of $19 billion. Now, it's important to know that this is considered the second largest and most expensive federal procurement in Canadian history. So it's a lot of money and, and there's... Um, so there's there's a lot of attention on this contract. Uh, the Canadian government hasn't made a decision yet about which plane it's going to buy. So there is time 
for the Canadian peace movement to unify and to rally to, to stop this purchase. Now, we have succeeded in stopping uh, procurement in the past. So, for instance, when Stephen Harper, the Conservative government from 2006 to, um, to 20, 2014, when, um, when they were in power, they said they wanted to buy 65 F-35s. Well, we mobilized and we made it impossible for Harper. I mean, they they almost signed, uh, you know, signed on the diet line, but we raised uh, so much opposition that uh, they couldn't go through with the with the purchase. And in fact, Trudeau, uh, when he was running in that uh, 2015 election, that federal election, the Liberal Party announced that uh, they did not support the F-35. Now, the F-35 uh, is, you know, the Lockheed Martin combat aircraft, and it's actually considered the most expensive weapon system in human history. It's going to cost about $1.3 trillion to buy, to, to, to build all of these uh, F-35s. The UK has already bought them, Belgium has already bought them, Australia has already bought them, Germany might buy them, you know, Israel is buying some, uh, Qatar might be buying some, um, and uh, there's intense pressure from the, the US government for Canada to buy one of the two uh, American fighter jets, but the, Peace movement in Canada, we are totally opposed to this uh, procurement because we know that this is going to deprive Canadians from the things that they really need. Uh, we have a massive homelessness crisis in this country. We have a poverty crisis in this country and we need uh, affordable housing. We need mental health care. We need um, action on climate change. We need public transportation. We need a massive upscaling of renewable energy. The other thing that we're yeah. doing in this campaign. So last uh, summer, we, we uh, came together to to uh, form this No New Fighter Jets campaign. We've had National Day of Actions. We've stood outside of our Member of Parliament's offices with signs that say No New Fighter Jets. We've uh, had petitions and letter writing campaigns. And, uh, you know, we'll continue uh, with our opposition. We've written like op-eds, letters to the editor to oppose this procurement. Um, the other argument that we're making about why Canada can't buy these fighter jets, um, is is because Canada will not be able to de to decarbonize if we buy these fighter jets. Yeah, these fighter jets are extremely carbon intensive. They use a tremendous amount of fuel. So one flight of a fighter jet of one of these fighter jets consumes as much fuel as as a standard. Uh, uh, res a standard car, you know, for a year, and these so it's fighter sort of, so it's so it's sort of like the equivalent of of you know an out of you know of, of 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 an alcoholic or somebody who's really sick from consuming too much alcohol or 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 smoking too much cigarettes and just having that one drink, just having that one you know shots or that one beer or that one you know Marlboro pack. Is basically game over for you know your liver or your lungs. Uh, yeah, that's it's what going spider to... jets are to 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 the planet's ecosystem. Uh, yeah, absolutely. They they are they're they're so bad for the climate, right? Um, and they are also so bad for people. I mean, what are fighter jets for? Fighter jets are for fighting. They're for they're for airstrikes. They're for bombing. They're for killing people, and they're for destroying buildings. So, you know, they're not good for people. They're not good uh, for the planet, and we can't afford them. Canada has. Um, other pressing obligations now with this pandemic. We know what really provides human security and it's not fighter jets. We uh, know that China and Russia are not our enemies and we uh, do not uh, want to be investing in fighter jets. Uh, we want to be investing in things like um, 
uh, uh, the the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Canada, the international community, have commitments to help uh, the, the poorest, more most vulnerable people on the planet who are going to be disproportionately affected by by climate change. You know, we have obligations to them. We have got obligations to the poor and vulnerable in this country. Those are the priority, and that's why we're saying uh, we don't want one dollar to go to new fighter jets. We absolutely don't need them. But the pressure to buy new fighter jets is coming from NATO and is coming from the United States. And so this is also why making the argument against NATO is so important. Um, and, and so this is why the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace, we are very pleased to take the lead on no new fighter jets and to take the lead on Canada out of NATO, um, no to NATO. Yeah, uh, exactly. With I mean, with all that money, Canada could actually end uh, indigenous uh, poverty overnight and can give people pharmacare, merge mental health care with uh, with an existing single payer system and give people free to low cost uh, dental uh, dental care. And again, it's just, you know, what a boondoggle. And that leads to this second to last question of mine. Uh, you mentioned China and Russia are not our enemies. Uh, that's uh, I I agree with you, but uh, some pseudo leftists and uh, and <laughs> and cruise missile feminists don't agree with you on that. And and so so that leads to this question, which is how important is it, given all we've discussed and the goals of your. Uh, uh, you, you know, in the goals of your organization, that regardless of what one thinks of the leadership or the system of China, Russia, Iran, or Syria, but specifically China and Russia, who actually who 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 actually have nuclear weapons, which I know your organization strives for the abolishment of that and all weaponry. Uh, but regardless of what one, so yeah, regardless of what of of what one thinks of of autocratic governments abroad any kind of warfare is not the answer uh you know you know any kind of warfare is not the answer and exhaustive diplomacy is the path to uh, is, is is the path to peace so can you so can you discuss that and the youth nuclear disarmament uh, body of your organization and, and and the campaign to yeah detente with russia and china and you know de you know de you know denuclearize uh, the planets so, people-to-people uh, -people diplomacy has been very important to the Canadian Voice of, of Women for Peace since our inception in 1960. Uh, VOW, for instance, have led women's delegations uh, to, well, the former so Soviet Union and uh, to other countries in order to to, to meet people, to, to make friends. So, we absolutely believe that uh, Russia and China are not our enemies and that we need to be uh, using diplomacy to make uh, friends with, with these countries. Uh, we are very well of, aware of the fact that our government and our uh, corporate controlled media continue to portray these two countries as enemies, but this, these are pretexts to, to uh, maintain a robust military to increase military spending to have aggressive foreign policy with the United States uh, to maintain our membership in NATO, but we we uh, reject all of that um, entirely. Um, we know if you if we were to take the perspective of Russia, who is very concerned that NATO countries, including Canada, have soldiers, fighter jets, warships, and fighter uh, fighter jets, uh, soldiers, and warships right on their border. You know, like I, I said earlier, Canada has hundreds of soldiers in Latvia right now. I mean, this is right on Russia's border. We have fighter jets in Romania. We have um, uh, warships in the Mediterranean and the Baltic. Uh, see the Black Sea, that um, is extremely provocative to Russia, and 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 Russia is feeling very um, uh, you know very uh, uh, threatened by by NATO. So the answer isn't more militarism. The answer is disarmament and diplomacy. It, it you know the the conventional NATO approach just it, it, it is is not working. Um, um, 
you know, we also think, for instance, that um, uh, that, uh, uh, you know, uh, Russia has a military budget of only $65 billion. I mean, this is this is very low. Uh, NATO's combined military budget is over $1 trillion. China, its wow. military budget is about uh, $230 billion. This is, you know, one fifth, a quarter of what NATO is spending militarily. Um, and NATO is, you know, it's a, it's, 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 it's a military project. Look at what China is doing the round, around the world with its Belt and Road Initiative. That's a development project. They're investing not in military bases all over the world. They're investing in ports and highways and trains and telecommunication systems, yep. right? In developing countries, you know, they're partnering with developing countries on infrastructure partner uh, on projects, right? I, I, I mean, it's a, a nearly a, a one trillion dollar international development project. And but what's NATO doing? I mean, NATO is trying to it's expand its bases around the world. It, it's just totally um, it, it's they're totally antithetical a uh, project. So we should we should be partnering with Russia and China on our common human security challenges. On the pandemic, we should have been partnering with Russia and China on developing together a vaccine. It would have come out sooner and it would have been more widely distributed. We should be partnering with China and Russia, you know, the two, uh, you know, two uh, uh, you know, big countries, you know, big economies on the climate crisis. You know, we need China and Russia to work with us on the climate crisis and the poverty crisis. And in fact, I encourage people to listen to President uh, Vladimir Putin, his speech that he made just a couple of weeks ago at the World Economic Forum. He pleaded for global cooperation on dealing with poverty and inequality. He said, you know, those are our challenges. Um, wow, interesting. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and the same thing, you know, China wants to to, to work with other countries, you know, through the World Health Organization on dealing with the pandemic. Um, but you see, it's NATO that is blocking, blocking this type of cooperation. And this is why NATO is a, a, a huge obstacle. It's an obstacle to global solidarity and international cooperation, and it needs to, to no longer exist. Would you uh, uh, would you make the arguments uh, or not even the arguments? Uh, would would uh, you know? Would would you boldly state that 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 uh, that uh, NATO's uh, war games uh, uh, with uh, Russia? You know, you mentioned the coup in uh, you know the NATO backed coup in uh, Ukraine and and the the growing anti uh, china derangement sy syndrome that's ha that's taking that that's taking across you know much of europe all of the fi the, the five eyes alliance uh, you know what john pilger was warning about in his documentary about the pivot to asia is that is is this canada and the west uh, playing a dangerous game of chicken with the russians and the chinese to provoke them into a conflict which Heaven forbid could act could actually result in accidental nuclear uh, uh, you know nuclear ho holocaust and of course the damages to that are is, is irreversible. Uh, absolutely, and it's going to get worse. Last year, NATO announced a new initiative called NATO 2030, and if you read this document, it identifies two key targets: Russia and China. And uh, China is is not in Europe. NATO is supposed to be an alliance that you know s supposedly protects Europe from uh, from from Russia. So uh, this new NATO initiative is giving permission to NATO to expand geographically, financially, and politically. And it's extremely dangerous and it must be resisted. And I encourage people to check this out, NATO 2030, because if NATO 2030 comes to pass, it will mean the Paris Agreement targets by uh, 2030 will not be achieved. Yeah. It will also mean that the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals by 2030 will not be achieved. 
uh, because both of those initiatives require global cooperation and they actually require a ton of resources, but it's all going to be diverted to this very dangerous and destabilizing project called NATO 2030. This is why it is so critical for uh, peace groups around the world and uh, social justice groups, the left to unify in working together to dismantle NATO. Um, so, uh, uh, it, it, you know, we we are we are very worried. I mean, this is this is uh, why, for instance, we've been also starting to build um, a, a movement in Canada to to say, you know, no war with China, a uh, peace with China. Uh, those types of movements are starting to come out in the United States and the United Kingdom because people can see now that John Pilger was right that uh, that the the west is very concerned about chinese economic power and chinese influence around the world and they're wanting to um uh, to, you know wanting to stop it so uh, uh we don't want this kind of aggressive militaristic approach towards russia and china we want we we want solidarity and cooperation uh with these two important countries Actually, then actually uh, completely agree with you. Then two two quick final questions then is, uh, can you make the feminist case why people should be opposed, uh, why, why people should be opposed to the ongoing war in Afghanistan and should support uh, a complete, uh, you know, troop withdrawal of NATO's, uh, you, know, you, know, of, you know, of NATO uh, in uh, Afghanistan? Uh, NATO's mission in Afghanistan has been a, an absolute total failure. It has it has um, uh, caused uh, an increase in violence in the country, uh, increase to poverty uh, in the country, and in fact. If you look at the United Nations uh, drug report, they do annual reports on 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 drugs and the the drug trade uh, the the poppy heroin uh trade in uh, in afghanistan has uh, has has increased um ironically nato has uh fomented instability poverty and and drugs in that in that country um nato has been an absolutely terrible force in afghanistan and um and it it needs to get out with the united states but you see it's going to be hard for nato to and the united states to withdraw because afghanistan is geopolitically uh significant i mean it does border china for instance and uh, it borders a number of other countries um and so i uh, uh it, nato and the united states are not in afghanistan to help that country they are there because it's geopolitically strategic especially if there is if there they were to plan a war with china it's right on china's border um um and i i also just want to to uh to, to mention uh, uh to mention quickly about uh, nato and nuclear weapons nato is yeah. maintaining its it's a uh, nuclear deterrence all of the nato countries um are refusing to join this important new treaty on uh, called the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons that came on, into force on january 22nd so if you think about you know our liberal democracies that uh, that purport to care about international law and peace and security and human rights um our countries, Canada, the United Kingdom, the United States, are not joining the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons to abolish the worst weapons of mass destruction because of our membership in NATO. Um, uh, NATO has said since its inception as an alliance that nuclear weapons are uh, fundamental to its security. It will not give up nu nuclear weapons. So this is another reason why we need to get out of NATO. And the organization that I'm with, the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace, we have cared about nuclear disarmament since 1960, and uh, we've worked very hard on uh, trying to be part of the movement to 
to abolish nuclear weapons, the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons. Um, and so we, we can see very clearly that uh, NATO is another obstacle to, to um, ridding the world of these terrible weapons of mass destruction for which there is no, there's, there's no response to. Um, and so this is why NATO's time is up. And I just have to add that the uh, the feminists who supported the war in Afghanistan, well, they just supported rival imperialists and they only inflamed the humanitarian crisis for women in Afghanistan in which the Taliban are stronger and the Northern Alliance are also committing systemic human uh, systemic war crimes towards Afghan uh, towards Afghani women and children. So, indeed, we need to be a we we need to campaign uh, much more against the uh, ongoing war in in, in uh, Afghanistan. Well, yes, and 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 Canada has an obligation, Yuri, to Afghanistan because we you know fought a war there from two thousand effectively from two thousand and two to two thousand and 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 fourteen, yeah. and we. Uh, we're on. We were, you know, fighting alongside the U.S.-backed illegitimate government of, uh, you know, of Karzai, a government full of a lawyer Jirga, a parliament that was full of 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 war illegitimate warlords, um, and um, you know, we know from having. People like Malalaya Joya, who did a number of tours across Canada, uh, Afghan women do not want uh, soldiers in their countries. They want uh, nurses and doctors and school teachers. And we know from other brave uh, women, for instance, like Kathy Kelly, who's been to Afghanistan about 20 times and who works very closely with the Afghan peace movement there. You know, they they um, they they don't support the Taliban. They don't support the warlords. Uh, they don't support the foreign uh, forces, the U.S. soldiers and the uh, the NATO forces. They, they 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 want the violence to stop. They want um, human development and and real human security. They they desperately need housing and healthcare and 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 food security and those kinds of things. And so our our countries owe a debt to Afghanistan. Um, and and we should be honest about what we did. Canada actually should have a national inquiry into uh, what. Our combat mission and the fact that we were we were engaged in war crimes in Afghanistan, um, we should support the International Criminal Court's investigation into U.S. and other foreign forces and uh, particularly NATO forces war crimes and crimes against humanity committed in that country. So there's a lot to do. Um, there's a there's there's a lot that uh, needs to be done in Afghanistan, but we need to be honest about what what we were doing there first. Yes, and we all should be locking up the war criminals, not locking up the truth tellers like Julian Assange. And my final question yes. then, uh, because today is a flag day in uh, Canada, and we've been uh, pushing back against a lot of uh, Canadian propaganda and Canadian uh, nationalism today. And and the final question I wanted to uh, ask you is, is, I know in Canada there was nationwide solidarity protests against the state murder of uh, George Floyd. And uh, Black Lives Matter in Canada erupted, and we and I, you know, I saw a very interesting development where you had, you know, Black Lives Matter of Canada speaking out against institutional racism in Canada and police brutality in Canada, and the and the kind of Indigenous Lives Matter, the Native Lives Matter, the I don't know more, uh, you know, you know, movement sort of merging with each other in, you know, in solidarity uh, against, you know, white supremacy in Canada. Uh, can, 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 you, can, can you reflect on, uh, you know, on, 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 on that? And is that growing solidarity uh, 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 bridging still, uh, st 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 still, still taking place in Canada? Yes, let me just say at the outset that there has been a terrible uh, police brutality against the indigenous community in this country and against uh, black and brown uh, people in, in Canada. It's uh, not just a, a US problem, it's very much a, a problem in Canada. Uh, indigenous people, for instance, are disproportionately in our criminal justice system and, and um, 
Uh, Same in Australia and New Zealand as well, and and yes, and, and, yeah, and other and places. Have, and we have, uh, you know, the terrible problem of uh, missing and murdering women. Uh, and, you know, thousands of of women that have um, have been. Um, have been killed, have gone missing, and the police uh, did not provide uh, sufficient, um, you know, help to try to investigate, you know, what was going on. So um, marginalized uh, people in this country have definitely been been brutalized and victimized by the police services, by the state, absolutely. And there's definitely been emerging of movements, the peace movement, the social justice movement has absolutely partnered very closely with Black Lives Matter and with Idle No More. Uh, so uh, last year when there were uh, protests in response to the brutal killing of George Floyd, there were huge protests all across the country. It, in the uh, city where I live, uh, Water, Kitchener Waterloo, there the biggest protest ever took place in in um, my city. There were uh, tens of thousands of people, and uh, and it was like this right across Canada. So uh, we are in solidarity with with uh, activists all over the world who um, want to to uh, to to demilitarize the police, to demilitarize the state, to um, shift the resources away from, you know, white supremacist organizations and police forces and militaries into things that really will help people, uh, mental health services, affordable housing, uh, uh, community programs, uh, food programs. I mean, those are the kinds of things that we need. So, uh, uh, yeah, and it, with Indigenous people, uh, we know that the Indigenous people are on the front line in protecting our water resources, our environment. Uh, there were many protests, for instance, last January and February, uh, uh, protests and blockades to support the Wet'suwet'en people who were yeah. pro who were uh, resisting a pipeline crossing their territory in in northern British Columbia, and we are opposed to new pipelines. Uh, across Canada, we know that we need a transformation of our energy. Uh, we need green energy. We need um, we need to be working together on uh, on a just transition. Well, on that uh, on that wonderful uh, on on that wonderful uh, note, and I can only hope that the uh, people power movement in Canada continues to grow. And I think there is signs of. Uh, of uh, hope, I I recently read uh, Eve Angler's uh, latest uh, article on a series of uh, defeats that the uh, that the uh, Canadian government has received uh, overseas. Canada also got rejected from a seat at the United Nations Security Council, and uh, and and uh, yeah, and um, I know that, uh, and you know, and and you know, there's or you know in. In the U.S., there's the Black Alliance for Peace, which is also trying to, you know, educate people to say that you can be against police brutality at home, but it must be connected to the anti-black uh, and warmongering policies abroad. So I only, I can only hope that the, you know, that the People Power movements, which you're a part of, continues to grow, uh, to grow. So. Yeah. Well, we, yeah. We're, Yuri, just let me end really quickly by saying yeah. that we. Uh, that the Canadian peace movement has worked very closely with Black Alliance for Peace, with other peace groups and social justice groups around the world, because we see all of the uh, all of the issues are so connected, and that we really need to work together for for change. People united will never be defeated. defeated. So on that, exactly. so, uh, on that note, we were joined on this edition, this this fantastic edition of uh, One Plus. Uh, one all our our all things Canada edition with Tamara Lawrence. Uh, Tamara, I really hope uh, uh, I I can have you back on uh, again and 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 have you as a regular. Thank you so much for joining me. And I know it's also uh, you know forget uh, Flag Day. It's also it's also Family Day in Canada. So a very happy uh, Family Day to uh, you and your family. And uh, thank you so much for joining me. And I look forward to having you back on again in the future. <laughs> thank you, Yuri, very much for having me. Take care. Bye. Likewise.